concerns raised about patient altercations at the LPH. It's been 20 years since the tragic Baby Doe case. And local officials discuss the pros and cons of dashboard cameras. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Well, officials at St. Joseph's Care Group are denying reports about an increase in altercations between patients at the Lakehead Psychiatric Hospital. A source inside the facility contacted our newsroom claiming several fights have broken out between dementia patients and other mental health patients. The source attributes the conflict to region, recent restructuring at the LPH, which combined the two types of patients into one unit. St. Joseph's Care Group CEO Tracy Buckler confirms that in early February they combined their dementia care and older adults rehab units at the facility. The total of number of beds was also reduced from 48 to 38 in anticipation of the future construction of a new mental health wing at St. Joseph's Hospital. But Buckler denies that there's been a rash of altercations involving patients. There are always incidents that occur, unfortunately. We try to minimize risks whenever we can. Um, I'm not aware of specific incidents that would have been caused as a result of that merger. There's no bearing on any client incidents that occurred uh, as a result of merging those two populations together. Officials with OPSU, the union representing workers at the LPH, say they have concerns about the recent changes at the facility. Lack of acute psychiatric beds for seniors, responsive behaviors, uh, particularly dementia care, Alzheimer's, and uh, as, as that happens, uh, assaults tend to uh, arise, uh, so, you know, it's, it's a constant. It's just inevitable, unfortunately. Arvelin says it's tough to give the specific number of incidents without breaking confidentiality. Buckler maintains the amalgamation of the two units has gone great and says she has no concerns. 20 years ago this weekend, the frozen body of a baby boy was found at Boulevard Lake. The case brought shock and tears to people around the city for the victim, identified only as Baby Doe. The case remains an unsolved mystery for Thunder Bay Police and continues to haunt some local residents. Michelle Sufi reports. He would have turned 20 years old this year. The frozen body of Baby Doe was found in a garbage bag on March 9, 1994, near Boulevard Lake. Local resident Tracy Hurlbert recalls the details of this heartbreaking case like it happened yesterday. She says she would have wanted him. And I've been talking with friends at that point in time. I wanted to have children, and I've never been able to. And my friends and I were discussing how we would have loved to have that little baby. And it struck home that there's lots of people that would have wanted him. Constable Julie Tilbury says because he was an infant, it has been very hard to find out exactly what happened or why he was discarded. She says even though 20 years have passed, the case still remains open and they are yet to be finished with the investigation. Anything that has come into the police has been um, followed up by investigators. Uh, every so often we will have a new set of eyes take a look at the case, uh, review all the information that is put forward and uh, see if there's anything that we've missed and uh, where else we can uh, look at. Hurlbert says the death of Baby Doe hit the community hard 20 years ago. She says his funeral service was filled up to capacity with crowds of people on the street. She says even though no one had ever met him before, it was still a very emotional day. Big, huge police officers carrying this tiny little casket. And there was one female police officer that I remember seeing her face and there were tears in her eyes. And I thought, you know, to make a police officer cry, these people see all kinds of things. Tilbury says this is one of the most unusual cases in Thunder Bay. But it's something that's not normal in, in society to do this, so um, I think it just raised uh, the community concern. Tilbury urges the public to come forward to either the Thunder Bay Police or anonymously to Crime Stoppers if they have any information so they can finally wrap up this case and give closure to people like Hurlbert. Rochelle Sufi, TBT News. Well, more and more people are installing dashboard cameras in their vehicles, and yet another high-profile accident in the region earlier this week may prompt others to follow suit. Dash cams are already very popular overseas, and local stores are now reporting an increase in sales. 
But as Phil Darlington explains, there are several things to consider before you have one installed in your own vehicle. Since the dash camera video of this accident near Kenora was released, OPP are now considering additional charges against the other driver. It's a similar case with this near tragedy near Nipigon back in January, as the dash cam video helped police identify the other driver. Dash cams are appearing more and more on area roads and highways, and police say there are both pros and cons to their use. The video has assisted us uh, for the drivers who weren't at fault. Uh, these videos could also, if you had a camera in your in your vehicle and you were the at fault driver, uh, we could we could uh, with judicial process take that video and it could be used against you. A lot of people think that uh, a video is uh, rock solid, um, iron clad, bulletproof, and it's absolute proof in anything. But as uh, the police and and people in the legal profession know that evidence is only evidence when the judge says it's evidence. It's also important to note that when buying a camera there are some which have been deemed to be illegal. Cameras that obstruct the driver's view or which have a screen that is visible to the driver are some of the options that would make a camera illegal. And consumers should also know that having a dash cam will not benefit how much they pay for insurance. Currently right now none of the insurance companies that we're aware of are offering discounts for having it in their vehicle. Um, I think the result of having these will eliminate fraud or help eliminate fraud and therefore can see a discount or sorry not discounts but reductions in insurance premiums. Even still the cameras are a useful tool that police and other users can testify are helpful in the case of an incident. Canadian Tire Store owner Bruce Stone says they've sold a number of them since the two accident videos went viral and he's gotten a few dash cams for himself. And it continuously records and then the event of an event, uh, you can take out the chip, you can load it in a computer, and you can you know, share it or play it back. They are, if you're not at fault, they're a great thing to have. Phil Darlington, TBT News. The global mining industry's largest annual event wrapped up this week in Toronto, but there are no new developments to report regarding the Ring of Fire. Northern Development and Mines Minister Michael Gravel recently returned from the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada Convention. He says the PDAC conference provided a great opportunity for him to meet with a number of mining companies and Aboriginal leaders. But he says ultimately the only meaningful Ring of Fire discussions continue to take place between Frank Iacobucci, the Ring of Fire point man for the province, and Bob Ray, the lead negotiator for the Matawa First Nation Chiefs. When that will be done. This is an important process that basically uh, will be determined by the chiefs, and I'm, I am, as I said, uh, certainly getting um, a sense that we're getting we're getting closer to that uh, that opportunity to to uh, to sign off on the agreement. But that will be ultimately determined uh, when the chiefs are in a position to do that. The Stillwater Mine Project in Marathon has been brought to a standstill. Residents and politicians in the community responded with disbelief on Wednesday to an announcement that shareholders have rejected the viability of the platinum and copper mine located just six kilometers outside of Marathon. John Thompson has more. Silence spread over the crowd gathered at the Marathon Theater when the confirmation appeared on the screen that the mine wouldn't be going ahead. It read simply, the project will not provide an acceptable level of return to its shareholders. Stillwater Vice President Clark Gilbert says the announcement that Stillwater and Mitsubishi shareholders won't continue to financially support a new mine means he'll have to refocus. I think we're fairly close. I think if we can get, uh, you know, we've got a fairly extensive suite of these opportunities that we're looking at and all we need is a few of them to hit and I, I think we can get us over the line. The company remains committed to completing its feasibility study, but concerns such as the projected concentration of copper and palladium as well as drops in international markets have halted existing plans. Gilbert remains optimistic, suggesting a new plan could be in place within the next three years. Some of these projects that we're looking on could have fairly extensive uh, feasibility level activities associated with them. So depending on which ones look positive, and there's a number of stages that we'd have to go through from scoping level, which is where we're at right now, to a pre-feasibility to maybe even a feasibility. And every time you touch that next stage, it's almost like an order of magnitude more work that you've got to do. The public reaction to the announcement was dire as attendees offered to help out in any way they could. 
this project is needed. It's needed for Northwestern Ontario, it's needed for Marathon. We've had several mines closed. We have one in Marathon, two in Manitowoc, one north of Scriber. So we really need this investment. So we've got to push to make sure that it goes through when we see a, a new mine in this area. The pulp mill's down and, uh, you know, the mines are, uh, they'll eventually run out, I suspect. And uh, David Bell's closing down. So from an economic point of view, we, we need this project. Badly. Mayor Rick Dumas says the transportation and energy infrastructure on the proposed site are ideal, and he's taking the company's word as he sees Marathon's glass half full. They have to address the concerns risen by the, the overall change in scope of the project, but uh, I believe when they made the comment that uh, Mitsubishi uh, and as well as Stillwater Canada fully support the project and want to move forward and with the, uh, the new changes in scope of the feasibility study, we have to work with them and we, we continue to focus on the positives of the project because we believe that they're going to still move forward and develop this project here in Marathon. The mine's plans have been laid out 40 years into the future. Even if the opportunities transpire as Stillwater hopes, that will be extended a few years yet. John Thompson, TBT News. New bosses have been appointed at Ontario Power Generation in Hydro One. Former New Brunswick Premier Bernard Lord will be taking over as the chair of OPG. And ex-Ontario Cabinet Minister Sandra Pupatello will be the new chair at Hydro One, which operates the province's transmission network. Three OPG executives were fired in December after the Auditor General released a damning report about generous salaries, pensions and bonuses at the utility. And Hydro One has been mired in controversy lately regarding soaring hydro bills for some rural customers. The provincial government building on James Street remained closed for a third straight day following a water line break late Tuesday night. A spokesperson for Infrastructure Ontario says the lengthy period of cold temperatures in the city caused a water line running to the building to burst. Crews have been on scene since late thir Tuesday night and were having some trouble finding the break. The leak has now been located as of this morning, but the Service Ontario offices remain closed again today. They're expected to be up and running on Monday morning. Opponents of a proposed wind farm in the ski hills southwest of Peterborough, Ontario, are rejoicing over the cancellation of the project. The developer behind the Stone Boat Community Wind Farm project pulled the plug on construction of four giant turbines and future plans related to renewable energy. A concerned citizens group and the backers of the Buddhist temple currently under construction had mounted a massive anti-wind turbine campaign against the project. The developer hasn't said why the project was cancelled. Well, the majority of the country will set their clocks ahead one hour this weekend. Officials with Thunder Bay Fire Rescue hope the time change also serves as a reminder to test and change the batteries in your smoke and carbon monoxide alarms. The fire department had a booth set up at Intercity Shopping Centre today to help remind people to check the batteries and the devices. Public Education Officer Anthony Stuckaluck says it's important to test the systems and check the age of the alarms every six months. Stuckaluck says the devices can save lives. Just recently we've had a couple fires in the city where the, the, uh, the occupants of the building were alerted by a working smoke alarm and it's a matter of seconds from getting out of your house safely to not getting out. So it's very important that you have smoke alarms and more, <clears throat> more important that they work. Stuckaluck says a smoke alarm should be replaced every 10 years. The city is also asking people to recycle the used batteries by using the battery recycling bags recently delivered to local homes. League of University's Research and Innovation Awards were handed out last night to celebrate the dedication of researchers and students. Han Chen, a professor in the Faculty of Natural Resource Management, is the recipient of the Distinguished Researcher Award. Meanwhile, LU's newest Canada Research Chair in Arts Integrated Studies received a congratulatory framed letter from Prime Minister Stephen Harper. This was actually a surprise event for me. I didn't know why I was coming and I was excited to find out what it was. Um, I received a plaque, uh, a letter from the Prime Minister. Um, congratulating me on the CRC, so it's a real honor to receive the letter. I was nominated by uh, my colleagues and uh, uh, my collaborators, co collaborators from uh, other places. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a significant recognition of my career for the past 10 years. Lakehead University was recently ranked number one in Ontario and number two in Canada for research. Well, it's been called the Carnival Sideshow of Art Exhibitions. It's bizarre, provocative, sometimes even a bit disturbing, but it's always a lot of fun. 
Lakehead University's annual juried and major studio exhibition is on display now at the Thunder Bay Art Gallery. Hundreds of individual art pieces and a wide variety of mediums are prominently displayed throughout the gallery. The work of fourth-year student Katie Lemieux, comprised of a number of bound snowshoe hairs, is meant to illustrate how those with mental disorders are often treated as something less than human. She hopes it strikes a chord with viewers. I'm aiming for pensiveness. I want them to look at my piece and kind of think, wow, these are really realistic looking animals. And at the same time, I want them to feel a sense of emotion when they look in the eyes of the creatures and feel, why are they in this position? Um, what are they representing? And um, yeah, just I want them to feel the emotion tied with the sculpture itself. In my mind, like I look at all three of my pieces and I'm like, bam, I know exactly what they're supposed to mean. I know what I want the viewer to understand. But the viewer, of course, like even you coming into this, like you have no idea what my work is about. So it's definitely a huge, huge challenge. The student's work is on display now through the end of the month. The gala opening reception will be held next Friday evening. Well, the third annual Shake Your Booty event drew a big crowd of Zumba dancers last night at Pope John Paul II School. There are approximately 150 people for the Zumbathon and Salsa Infusion event. It's held every year to raise funds for colon cancer and create awareness. Shake Your Booty organizer and colon cancer survivor Maria Lento says she created the event to get people talking about colon cancer in our community. Colon cancer, stage two, and it was very scary. So if it could happen to me, it could happen to you, it could happen to anyone. So I want people to get screened before age 50, um, 40, whenever, take the FOBD testing with your physical, doesn't matter how old you are. I mean, we're here to have fun, but we also want to make sure that we raise awareness and so that people are aware that, um, that there are tests available and, and early detection is, is, is a must. If colon cancer is detected in its early stages, it's up to 90% curable. Lento is hoping to raise $20,000, which will go towards the Canadian Cancer Society.